All right. Hey, good morning, Three Circle Church and all of our campuses joining us, Midtown Mobile, Daphne, and Thomasville. It's great to be here today. We're going to continue our series that we kicked off two weeks ago on the Passover. And what we're doing is we are exploring this Old Testament thing that would happen every year called the Passover. And we want to look at what it really means and why it should matter to us. Why do we need to understand what was really going on at the Passover? And so what we said is we're going to keep one foot in the upper room with Jesus and the disciples where he transformed uh, the Passover. And we're going to keep another foot over in Egypt where, uh, where God led his people out of Israel and out of slavery to the Egyptians. And we call that event the Passover where God had sent all of these plagues onto Egypt to get Pharaoh to let his people go. Pharaoh would not let his people go. And so that rhymed. That was a good song growing up in my kids' ministry. Oh, oh, Pharaoh, let my people go. Anyway, how many Baptists do we have in the room? You know what I'm talking about. All y'all smiling? All everybody else is like, Christians are weird. Okay, whatever. So, so that, that happened, and then God said, the last plague I'm going to bring, it's going to work. Uh, the, the death angel is going to come, fly through, and is going to take the firstborn. But my people will do a very specific thing. They will take an unblemished lamb and unleavened bread. They will sacrifice that lamb and put its blood on the doorpost. They will then take part in a ceremony with this unleavened bread. And those who do that, the death angel will pass over. That's why we call it the Passover. The, the angel will pass over their house. They will be saved. They will be protected. Well, not only did they do it that night, but they were instructed to do it at every year to have a remembrance of what God did for them. But in week one, we did a comparison between Jesus, our Passover lamb, and every Passover lamb that had ever been before that time. And we showed that Jesus is the superior Passover lamb. We showed all the reasons why Jesus is the main event and all those things that happened. Every other Passover that happened in the Old Testament was simply a preview to the main event. So it's like when you go see the previews to a movie, you've not seen the movie yet. You just saw the previews. You need to go see the movie. Well, the Old Testament is a preview leading to the main event of Jesus. So let's go to the upper room now that we have looked at him as the Lamb of God. And let's look at the two different elements over the next couple of weeks that took place at the Lord's Supper and why it matters, why it should matter, why we need to understand it. We're going to look at the body of Christ, the bread, and the blood of Christ, the wine, the juice. Let's go to Matthew 26, 26. In the upper room, it says this. Now, as they were eating, the disciples and Jesus, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said this. This is important. He said, take Eat, this is my body. All right, now what is going on there? Let's write this down. Jesus on that night transformed the last Passover, because that's the last official Passover that night in that room. He transformed it into the first observance of the Lord's Supper ever. So on the same night, the last Passover became the first Lord's Supper. We don't have to do Passover anymore. Uh, we now do a thing called the Lord's Supper because Jesus transformed it. Now, look at what he said. How did he transform us? Let's go into that room. So this is an actual piece of bread that we're able to get from a museum that was there that night at the Last Supper. <laughs> that is not true. I'm pretty sure it came from Publix. But it looked a lot like this, I think. And imagine being there with Jesus and the disciples, and he grabs the bread and he breaks it, just like that. Now, at this point, nothing new has happened. None of the, this has not grabbed the attention of the disciples yet. It's a beautiful ceremony, but they had done it their entire lives. There's nothing, nothing new about this. And they had also done this with Jesus. Every year that they had been with Jesus at the Passover, they took the Passover together. This was not new. What was new is what he said. He transformed it by what he said. And what did he say? He said, now I'm going to tell you what this has meant all this time. Everything you've ever done has been a preview. I'm going to tell you what the movie is now. I'm going to let you know what's going on. This bread is my body. And the way I'm breaking it, it's going to be broken for you. Jesus transformed it. We need to understand that the Old Testament Passover and the New Testament Supper that we celebrate both represent Christ and his redemptive work. You need to understand that. The guys will put that on the screen. It represents Christ and his redemptive work in our lives. It matters because it represents something. 
We should hold it in very high regard. And in fact, today we're going to look at the body of Christ and the bread. And I want today to convince you that the body of Christ should be seen as something beautiful, something that we hold in the highest of regard. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus' human body was actually nothing special, that it was just a, it was a normal human body, and that if you would have looked at him, you wouldn't have said, oh man, like he didn't look like Thor from the Avengers. <laughs> Captain America did not show up. He was a normal Jewish human early 30s male. That's what Jesus looked like. Not only that, but if we go to the cross, the Bible says his body, by the time he went through the torture, by the time he got to the cross, when they hung him on the cross, the Bible says you would not have wanted to look upon him, that he was horrific to look at, that he did not look human anymore. You could not tell he was even human anymore. That's how badly they had broken and bruised and bloodied his body. Okay, so I'm going to try to convince you today, though, that that is beautiful. I'm going to try to convince you that the body of Christ is beautiful. And I want to tell you why today. Now, another thing Jesus did here that for many was weird, because this isn't the first time he taught like this, is he said, this is my body, eat it. Okay, now, you do know the Roman Empire used that against Christians. They used this whole thing. The rumor that they put out there for the Roman Empire, wherever Christians were, is they said, y'all do know Christians are cannibals, right? They eat flesh and drink blood. We'll prove it to you. They do it all the time. And, ooh, this made people think that the Christians were weird. They were cannibals, and now uh, the, the Romans could persecute them, even have them executed in the most heinous of ways because these are horrible, evil, wicked cannibalistic people because they eat flesh and drink blood but today what I want you to see is and Christians need to understand this what does Jesus mean when he says eat my flesh and drink my blood he means spiritual eating his body was a spiritual concept it was not a physical one and that should help us all understand what he's talking about now let me help you understand this concept you are a human how many humans do I have in the room just raise your hand there's some wives going, I don't know about this one, looking at their husband right now. I'm telling you, he is. You were created by God, physical and spiritual. You have a spiritual dimension and a physical dimension. Okay, Jesus comes, and he understands that better than anyone, obviously. And he teaches us this concept. When he says, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, he's talking about a spiritual concept, not a physical one. He, the same thing happened when he was talking to Nicodemus on a rooftop. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And Jesus was explaining to him, he said, Nicodemus, to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. Do you remember what Nicodemus did? Just like anyone who can only think physical and can't think spiritual, he said, oh, so you're telling me i got to crawl back into my mom and get into her womb and do that whole thing again? It's going to be hard. Look, I'm a grown man. And Jesus had to go, Nicodemus, come on, man. I'm not talking physical. What did he say? He said, what I'm saying is, all who enter the kingdom of God must be born two ways. To be a human, you have to be born of water. What's that? Physical. He said, but you also must be born of the Spirit. What's that? Come on, church, help me. That's spiritual. And so when Jesus at the Lord's Supper says, eat and drink, he's talking spiritual. And this was a concept that he absolutely explained over and over again in his ministry. We're going to look at it today. So what I want you to understand is what happened at the Exodus was physical. A lamb, blood, body. But Jesus is going to take it to the next level in the main event. And it's going to have spiritual implications. It will be physical as well. A real human body is going to be broken, and real human blood will be shed, but it will have spiritual implications. So now that we've gotten into the upper room and we see Jesus transforming it, let's go back to the Exodus, back into Egypt, and see what was happening there that parallels at the same time. Exodus 6, 6 through 8, God is speaking to his people directly through Moses. Remember, they didn't have Bibles. You have a Bible. How does God speak to us primarily? Through our Bibles. Through his word. They had the word back then too. It just wasn't in a Bible. It was through the prophets who would speak directly from God to the people. And here's what he says. Verse 6. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from. Everyone say from. All right, y'all get your pen out. We're going to do a little work today. Underline from. He's talking to the people of Egypt. 
of, of Israel who are in Egypt. He says, I'm going to deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. That was the plagues, verse 7. I will take you to be. Everyone say to be. Underline to be, please. Now we're going to compare these two things because they're very important. He says, I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out. From under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Now, why did I have you underline from and to be? Well, this is very important because he's looking at them, God, speaking directly to them like he does to us through the Bible. And he says, here's what I'm about to do. I'm going to do two things with one act. I'm going to save you from something and I'm going to save you for something. And we believe in the immutability of God. Immutability means God never changes. He's not one God in the Old Testament and then a different God in the New. He wasn't in a bad mood in the Old Testament and then Jesus comes and suddenly he's happy. We don't have two gods. We have one God unchanging. So the same God who saved Egypt, uh, saved Israel from Egypt but saved them for himself is the same God who saves us from sin but also for a relationship with him. Here's the good news. The Israelites were not just saved from something. They were saved for something. Write it down. And you and I, in the same way, God saves us from something and for something. That's important for you to understand. He saved Israel from slavery to Egypt, but he saved them to be his people. I grew up in a church that was awesome, and we'd have these preachers come in that threw a ah at the end of everything they said. That made it more spiritual. They'd come, even in the introduction, these guys got so good at it, they would even introduce themselves with the ah. They hadn't even gotten going yet. So they'd come in and say, good morning, church. Yeah. My name is Jim. Here to preach the word to you today. When a guy came in introducing himself like that, you better watch out. The fire is about to fall upon you. Oh, yeah. But you know what? A lot of times that preaching had a lot to do with what God saved me from, but very little to do with what he had saved me for. And I think we need to talk as much about what he saved us for as what he saved us from. I'm glad God saved me from hell. I'm just as excited, maybe even more so, that he saved me for a relationship with him. Yes, I am no longer a slave to sin, but I'm not just neutral. I am now an heir, a full heir in the spirit. I am a child of God, not neutral, but an adopted son, an adopted child of God. And now, therefore, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. We're not just saved from something folks we're saved for something today amen that's good news church don't ever forget that when God spoke to Egypt uh, to Israel and Egypt he didn't just say I'm saving you from them he said I'm saving you for me you're going to have a relationship with me we're going to change history together you are mine it's really good news today let me show you some parallels let's do Passover par parallels Things from the preview that was connected to the main event that Jesus is unveiling for us at the Lord's Supper. So let's look at them. First, got, get your pens ready. We're just going to burn some ink now, okay? Let's go to class. God rescued Israel from slavery to Egypt. Good news. He does the same for us. He rescues us from slavery to sin. So God rescued Israel from Egypt. He rescues us from slavery to sin parallel. Second, God claimed Israel as his own people. That's good. They weren't just saved from Egypt. They were saved for him to be his nation. God claims us in Jesus as his own children. He saves us into a family, saved them into a nation, saves us into a family. God saved them in the Old Testament and gave them a promised land. They have a land that he is preparing for them that he has for them oh he's done the same for us God gives us a promised kingdom we're part of a kingdom and we have a king and our king has a book and we're to live like citizens of the kingdom here on this earth we have dual citizenship every Christian so if you're an American Christian you have citizenship in the United States and you have citizenship in the kingdom same 
God guided his people. This is, this is a unique distinction about the living God. He talks to his people. He interacts with his people. And he interacted with the people of Israel through the prophets. He actually spoke to them. The living God speaking to humans. He does us as well. God guided them by fire at night and by cloud during the day. Right? He did that. He guides us by his word. We have a Bible. God speaks to us. Directly to us. Through his word. And then finally, the last one I want you to see a parallel. God was with them. Fire at night, cloud by day. He wanted them to know that he was with them. His presence was with them. But there's only one thing better than God being with you. Jesus told his disciples, it's good that I go away because I'm going to send one who will help you. Remember that? Jesus was with them. So the disciples were like, wait a minute. How can anything be better than you with us? Jesus said, I'm telling you, there's something better. Thomas is thinking, I doubt it, man. I doubt it. It's funnier in here than it is coming out, but I'm telling you, half the room just missed a very quality joke. Very quality. What's the only thing better than God being with you? Him being in you. God was with them. He is in us by his spirit. You see the parallels. Everything there was a preview to the main event that was coming. And they commemorated it every year. They commemorated what God did for them in the Exodus. And they were looking forward to the main event, what he was going to do. We all commemorate the Lord's Supper when Jesus transformed the Passover with our Lord's Supper element. And we look forward to his completion of all history. We look forward to the establishment of his kingdom in the future. So what about the bread? Was the bread involved in the Exodus? We looked at the lambs last week. Well, let's look at it. Verse 17 of Exodus 12. God is still speaking to his people. He said, you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread. Remember, the lambs had to be unblemished. Remember we said, you couldn't just bring your old crooked walking lamb that got ran over accidentally by a horse. You had to bring an unblemished lamb. The best one you could find. best lamb you had is the one you brought. Well, when it came to the bread, your bread couldn't just be old normal bread that you kind of threw together. No, it had to be pure, unleavened bread. For on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations. In other words, you're going to do this every year. You're going to teach your kids to do this. Same way we teach our kids the Lord's Supper. You'll observe this day, verse 18, in the first month, from the 14th day of the month at, at evening, you will eat unleavened bread. Until the 21st day of the month at the evening, for seven days, no leavens to be found in your house. Why no leaven in the house? Because you might accidentally get some of the bread. This was important, that that bread stay pure. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. In other words, God's saying, I'm not playing. I'm serious. You do this right. That's why we don't do Oreo cookies and Kool-Aid when we do the Lord's Supper. I had an intern try that at one of my first churches that I was at in Atlanta, and he almost lost his job. And I'll never forget, we bring him in, and he looks at us, and he's like, why does it matter? Because he did the Lord's Supper with a group of kids with Oreos and Kool-Aid. And before I could say anything, the lead pastor and incredibly godly theologian at our church looked at that young man and said, it matters because it's the body of Christ. And I thought, amen. That's why it matters. He was right. Why does it matter when we do the Lord's Supper? Why do we do music and stuff on the screens and we have prayer time and we talk it through before we grab that bread and grab that juice? Why don't we just do it and get on out of here and move on with our day? Why? Because it is the body of Christ. That's why, church. And we hold it in the highest of esteem. So why did it matter that no None of that leaven getting that bread because the Passover bread represented the sinlessness of Jesus. That's why. Because Jesus would be pure in body and spirit. In Exodus 12, 42, it says about that night, it was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night, So since he did that, that same night every year is a night of watching kept to the Lord. So one, it was given to them by the Lord. Now it says when they would celebrate the Passover, they kept it to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout all the generations. In other words, 
they received the Passover from God, right? That wasn't their idea. They didn't come to God and go, hey, we got a little deal for you here. I know you're sending the death angel. What if we get our best cheap lambs? What if we get a little unleavened bread and we do this thing? That wasn't their idea. No, God had a plan. He gave them Passover, and then every year they would celebrate Passover to him, right? It wasn't our idea for Jesus to come die for us. I promise you, there's not a person in this room who you found your way to Jesus. You didn't come up with that. That was all God's gift to you, the gift of salvation, right, church? So when we take the Lord's Supper, and not only that, but we live this way. We live as Christians going, we are so grateful. We celebrate what Jesus gave us in both the ceremony and his actual body and sacrifice. So the bread of the Passover also represented God's provision to them, and it represents in the Lord's Supper his provision for us. The body of Christ was God providing for us. So your body didn't have to hang on a cross. So your body didn't have to be scourged. So your body did not have to go through the sacrifice. He stood in our place, perfect, sinless. That's why it matters. It's why Oreos and Kool-Aid just won't do. No worries, we're not going to try that at three circle. Because we have a high view of what took place in Christ. Now, we just went back to the Old Testament. Let's step back to the New. Because when Jesus comes, so the Old Testament, remember, the people of the Old Testament had a relationship with bread. They had to do this unleavened bread thing every year for the Passover. But not only that, after God got them out of Egypt, they end up in the wilderness and they got no way to get food. And who, who shows up with bread every day? Their God. Manna from heaven comes down every day. And they would eat that manna. But now let me ask you a question. Was it magic bread? Was there anything magical about the bread God gave them? No, it was normal bread because what did they have to do the next day? Eat again. So it's normal bread, their bodies used it, and the next day they'd be hungry again. That's just normal bread, right? They were used to bread. But Jesus comes along, and when Jesus comes, he begins to talk about bread again. Again, the Israelites are very familiar with bread. they got a strong relationship with bread. Some of us today, we have a strong relationship with bread. We love bread so much, they do the keto diet, which has no bread, and we decided, you know what, we'll make keto bread. You go to your grocery store, you find out, what is keto bread? Butter that looks like bread, bacon fat that looks like bread, I don't know. If you look at the ingredients, is it bacon fat and butter? Anyway, all the keto people's like, leave my diet alone, man. Leave it alone. So Jesus comes, he talks about bread, right? Now, you know, we all understand that normal bread, normal food for the human, like it doesn't quench or feed us forever. You have to eat again. This is why a lot of y'all are going to go on vacation this week. Spring break, summer's coming. You know, on vacation, you end up eating a lot. That's what you do on vacation. And how many times have you ever had a big lunch with everybody on your vacation? And you said, "Woo, that was a big lunch, man. I bet I, I'm not going to have to eat the rest of the day. That was so big. And then 5 o'clock rolls around. And everybody said the same thing. Y'all had two plates of appetizers, fried shrimp, and then you had the shrimp and seafood platter with the hush puppies and all that. And you washed that down with a Diet Coke so you'd feel better about yourself. (laughs) Maybe a little key lime pie. And you're like, I will not eat the rest of the day. Five o'clock, everybody's looking at one another going, where are we going to (laughs) eat? Why is that? You got hungry again. That's what food does. Regular food. It doesn't doesn't make it go away forever. You got to eat again. Jesus understood this, and the context of what we're about to read, watch this, is Jesus had multiplied bread and fish for the people, and it just kept multiplying, and they all filled their bellies. And then Jesus tries to get away from the crowd, and they follow him. And when they catch up with him, he looks at them, and he's like, you're not here because you love me or that you want to hear from me. You're here for more food. You want another fish sandwich. And Jesus begins to teach them that regular bread is easy for him. His father did it in the desert. And he can do it now. He's proven to them he can do regular bread. But he's got a better one for them. He's come to do more. Look at John 6, 32. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. He's talking about the Israelites. But it was my father. Watch this though. And my father gives you the true bread from heaven. Oh, Jesus says there's normal bread, but then there's another kind of bread. It's true bread. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he, 
You might want to underline that. He's now saying the bread from God, the true bread, is a person. He's talking about himself. Who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Notice normal bread. What did bread that came in the Old Testament to the people do? It gave them nourishment temporarily. Jesus says there's a true bread that God's sending now who's a person who will give life not just to the person eating the bread in front of him, but to the whole world. Verse 34, they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Think about it. So they're all like, oh, you got some bread that's that good? Bring it on. We want some of that and we'd like a tub of butter to put on there too. Verse 35, Jesus said to them one of his great statements, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus says, I am the bread. Remember, the Lord's Supper, Jesus took a physical thing and showed them that it was spiritual. Eat of the bread. It is my body. Well, before the Lord's Supper ever took place in front of a big old crowd, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And when he said life, he could have chosen between two words in the Greek language. There's the word for life that is called bios. That means normal bread, just normal physical stuff. But he didn't say that. He said, I am the bread of another word. It's zoe. And write it down, zoe means spiritual. Once again, Jesus is talking about spiritual things. Folks, hear me today. One of the biggest problems with humanity is that we're spiritual and physical. And we think we can fill our spiritual hunger with physical bread. And you can't. You never will. You'll starve to death spiritually your whole life. Jesus comes and he says, I can give you and I will give you normal bread. But what I really came to do is give you spiritual bread. See, humans were made physically to run off of physical bread. But you were made spiritually to run off of the spiritual bread of Christ. That's why. He goes on to, if you, if you think Jesus doesn't like to create an awkward moment and then make it even more awkward, look what he says next. Verse 56. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. Now, do you see how the Romans could have turned them into cannibals for people? But what do we know he meant? Now what do we know? What does he mean? Does he mean physical or what? He means spiritual. He's saying people who feed and drink. And, and what, what you're going to see is the way you do that is by believing upon him. Remember he said, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger and whoever believes in me will never thirst. How do you eat and drink of Jesus? By believing in him. Verse 57, the living father sent me and I live because of the father. So whoever feeds on me spiritually by believing, he also will live. Isn't that how it works? If I believe in Jesus, I now live spiritually. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Look, now he makes the separation. Not like the bread our fathers ate. That was just normal bread. Not like that bread. And then they died. Not that. He says, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. What's he talking about? Eternal life. He's saying anyone who eats the spiritual bread of Christ will live forever, even though their bodies will die. They will never die. They are eternally alive. So here's how this works. We nourish our physical bodies by eating and drinking. We nourish our spiritual lives by believing upon Jesus. He is the bread of life. And his body was the bread. You know, on the cross, Jesus' body was broken. So much so you couldn't even recognize him. And the Bible gives us one more thing that we will conclude with today. For us to hold him in the highest of regard. It says that when he died, something happened simultaneously. You may have not realized this. Look at it. Matthew 27. Jesus cried out again on the cross with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. So his body that was broken died. He died. And at the same time, verse 51, behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now, why did the moment Jesus' body die, did the veil that had separated humans from the Holy of Holies, why was it torn from the top to the bottom? Showing that human, if humans had torn it, it would have torn from the bottom to the top. How did it miraculously tear from the top to the bottom? And does that matter? Does it? I want to show you why. Because that's what separated humans from being able to walk into the Holy of Holies, the presence of God. 
Well, Paul comes along, and in the book of Hebrews, he tells us, explains to us, why that mattered. Look what he says. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence, so Christians can have confidence walking into the place that every other believer in the Old Testament was terrified of, not us, we have confidence, to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, not just by his blood, but by a new and living way. So there's a new way we get into the Holy of Holies. And it's been open for us through the curtain. But he's not talking about the veil. Look what he says. That is through his, come on, look at it, flesh. So the veil that separated humans from the presence of God represented something, just like everything else represented something. And what did the veil in the temple represent? The body of Christ. And that veil would stand in place until the body of the Holy One of Israel was torn in two. And when it was torn in two, the veil was torn in two. And Paul says, let us now draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Church, Jesus' body was the veil. It was broken to give us access to the Father. And that is why I say to you today, beautiful is the body of Christ. Church, beautiful is the body of Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending us your Son. And we thank you for his body that was broken for us. We celebrate him, remember him, and honor him today in Jesus' name. Amen.